Societies are always changing, and in order to think like historians, we need to understand the context around how people lived. Battles, politics, governing documents, and leaders are not the only things of import. How the average person lived is just as important. Today, many of us have the bulk of human knowledge available to us at the touch of a button. A lot of us joke about not being able to put our phones down, but the reality is, the way we live our life now is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the differences between us and the Americans of 225 years ago. So in this episode, we're going to look a little bit at food, fashion, career paths, and social structure of the average person who lived in America just after the Revolutionary War. I'm Dr. Danielle Bainbridge, and this is Study Hall, U.S. History to 1865. When it comes to history, one source material is a crucial factor to consider. Specifically, primary sources, items that were created during the period of time being studied. Source material can be almost anything. A cup, a sarcophagus, diaries and journals, clothing, weapons, and everything in between. Even trash has been used as source material. One way historians can study daily life is through the use of everyday objects and utensils. This kind of evidence might not tell you what a king or president was thinking, or why a war started, but it might tell us something about what it was like for most people to live in a particular time and place. And that matters too. For example, let's think about what's now known as the New Guinea Settlement in Massachusetts. It doesn't exist anymore, but once upon a time in 1778, after the Revolutionary War, four enslaved men were given their freedom in exchange for their military service and they created one of the earliest known African-American settlements in New England. Their names were Cato Howe, Plato Turner, Prince Goodwin, and Kwamini Quash. Excavating the remains of their small community has shed light on how free men lived in Massachusetts and raised some questions. For example, West Indies pottery was found broken in a cellar floor that had been backfilled. Was this the property of one of the men who lived there? Was it refuse that made for easy rubble to infill a cellar? Did the people who lived there buy pots of tamarind or sugar, the most commonly conveyed items in those pots, or had they been reused? How did they get that far inland? Archaeologists also believe that at least one member of the New Guinea settlement was familiar with West African and Haitian shotgun houses and knew how to recreate it well enough to do so in Massachusetts. Archaeologists have unearthed enough kitchen waste to know that the families of New Guinea didn't have the same sorts of food remains that are usually found in contemporary Anglo-American dig sites, especially animal bones. Historians can only speculate the reasons for this, but one potential answer is that the people of New Guinea opted to eat a different cuisine, just like they opted to live in different houses. And this is an example of how historians use the small details of living in everyday life and the things we leave behind as we live it to tell us about the average person, no matter what the time period. While the town of New Guinea tells us about how formerly enslaved people lived, another class had been growing in size for a few centuries in Europe and its corresponding colonies. The middling sorts, or what today we might see as the middle class. People attempted to raise their station in a variety of ways. The years after the revolution saw Americans creating a number of academies intended for girls, granting new academic opportunities to a demographic that had been largely self-educated prior to the war. Academies generally taught grammar, history, and geography. Some even taught courses in Latin, chemistry, and other natural sciences. Which was great because by today's standards, much of the healthcare during this era was questionable at best. Mercury, for example, was thought to be a suitable treatment for syphilis. Yikes. Not to say that there weren't methods of the time that were useful. Healthcare looked different in the 18th century. People from all walks of life relied on herbal remedies. Some had value, but viruses and bacteria, which no one yet understood, often won out. As we've seen, native populations also suffered from a lack of immunity to European-born illnesses. But things like antibiotics and effective anesthesia for surgery simply did not exist. There were also some medical treatments that, unlike the gentler herbal approach, probably did more harm than good, like bleeding, purging, and yes, puking. While some aspects of society were still very much developing, this era saw dramatic changes in technology. The steam engine, one of the most crucial inventions of the era, was originally developed in England early in the 18th century. The initial design for the engine was impractical and dangerous. However, in 1765, James Watt engineered an improved steam engine that impacted and changed society in ways that are incalculable. 
Everything from produce to housing developments and everything in between was affected by the improved steam engine, although it wasn't until 1807 that inventor Robert Fulton built the first actual and successful steamboat named the Claremont. But the steam engine was hardly the only significant invention of the era. We've got to spend some time talking about Benjamin Franklin because he invented so many things. Like an early version of the odometer, designed to track the distance traveled by carriages. He also mapped the Gulf Stream, developed swimming fins that could be worn on one's hands, and invented bifocals. He was even able to improve healthcare by creating a flexible catheter. The Franklin stove is another popular invention of the time. I don't know much about fireplace schematics, but I can tell you what Franklin told us. Basically, this thing sits in the middle of your room, keeps it a lot warmer than older stove styles, and uses less wood and smoke. And because Franklin was the goat, he passed on patenting his invention. It was for the greater good. In fact, Franklin never patented any of his inventions. Basically, he thought that his education came from other people's knowledge, and he benefited from that. So it was only fair that other people were educated by and benefited from his knowledge. That's kind of unusual in today's day and age, and that's one of the reasons we need to understand history and how the people who lived in it, well, lived. What they thought, what motivated them, because that gives us greater context to the decisions made by political leaders of the same time. As historians, it is our responsibility to leave no stone unturned in the search for historic fact, whether it be discovering how Cato Howe and his neighbors came upon those jars, or what led Benjamin Franklin to tie a key to his kite instead of some other piece of metal. It's in these details that historic truth can be found. Thanks for watching Study Hall U.S. History to 1865, which is part of the Study Hall project, a partnership between ASU and Crash Course. If you like this video and want to keep learning with us, be sure to subscribe. You can learn more about Study Hall and the videos produced by Crash Course and ASU in the links in the description. See you next time.